I've written and deleted this script about eight times now because I've found myself frustrated at trying to explain a story that so elegantly unfolds itself. I've started by trying to explain the game point for point, but you could easily play it and it would explain more to you than this video ever could. I then tried to break down the characters and have a deep dive into the mechanics, but I felt like I wasn't able to articulate myself well enough. And again, playing the game yourself would explain more than I ever could. And I think that's where I found myself today. I feel like I've been trying to do a balancing act between the story and the gameplay while ultimately leaning more towards one the farther into the script that I go. Because honestly, I'm not as eloquent as others. I don't feel like I could casually throw in the term ludonarrative dissonance without rolling my eyes at the pretentiousness of it. I just like games. And I like games that make me feel something. So while I'm sure this video essay won't be anything that breaks the internet, I hope it can convey the feelings that I experienced throughout my gameplay. Now that I've started off this video by explaining how I'm not a good video essayist, and I'm not as eloquent as others, I feel like I've set the bar at the perfect height. Honestly, I never even expected to play The Witch's House. I was scrolling through Steam and saw the thumbnail and decided to purchase it on a whim. I could tell it was an RPG Maker game and that there were horror themes and it probably heavily relied on its story. And to me, that was perfect. I didn't want a game that was going to require pinpoint precision. I wanted to play something where I could literally just use one hand and soak up the story like a sponge in a sink full of water. So I bought it on sale, I installed it, and dove right in. Best case scenario, I'd enjoy it. Worst case, I didn't like it, and I was out a few bucks. Let's start with how the witch's house begins. We see a girl waking up in a bed of flowers, surrounded by trees. Where's she at? I have no idea. But what I do know is that there's a black cat chilling on a stump right next to us. And interacting with that cat, he's so friendly. He doesn't ask us our name, he just talks to us. Immediately upon starting the game, I wanted to know what my character's name was. And talking to the cat didn't yield any information, but I love how tucked away in your menu is your character's name. We're playing as a girl named Viola, and also on her person is a letter. It's from her father, and it reads, I don't mind if you go out to play, but don't go too deep into the forest. Hope to see you home soon, Dad. So now the pieces are starting to form. We're a lost girl in the woods. Our father is probably worried about us. And there's a talking cat. Now there is another object in this area that we've woken up in. There's a signpost that tells us the forest exit is to the south and someone's house is up ahead. Going up the path to the house, it's covered with roses, so I can't make my way through. And heading south brings me to another patch of roses I can't get through. But there's a little offshoot to the side with a shiny object on the ground. And it's a machete. Now, even with the machete in hand, I can't cut through the roses that lead out of the forest. So the only option is to go to the house. We use the machete on the roses. And the path is clear. I'm finally ready to enter this house. It doesn't look like it's seen the touch of a person in years, but the door opens by itself. All I'm saying is that if a door opens by itself, there's trouble. Stepping inside, it's tiny. There's nothing except a single door. And as I pass through to the other side, I see blood on the floor and a note on the wall. Being me, I decided to inspect the blood because I want to know what's going on, and then... Dead. I had no time to react to the walls closing in on me like that. At this point, I'm wondering if there's going to be cheap deaths like this throughout the game. But regardless, Viola can't actually die. This is a never-ending cycle for her. So I already like that you get to go back and try it again, knowing what to avoid and what not to do. I spawn back at the cat and head back into the house, this time avoiding the blood that pulled me in so seductively last time, and read the note on the wall. It says, come to my room. At this point, I'm wondering... How the hell am I supposed to do that when the previous room only led me here? So I walk out and I find the house is shifted. Our cat buddy is back and now there's multiple ways for me to go. Oh, also, I can't leave. So now the real journey has begun. Stuck inside of a shape-shifting house that wants to kill us. Hot dog. So every time I'm faced with a decision of going left or right, I go right. And what did I do this time? I went to the right. It's a small hallway but I see a door and I go inside to check it out. There's a basket in the middle that has a teddy bear in it and then a note on the wall. The note just says, bears in basket. 
I don't have a bear, so I head out and I check the hallway again to find another door at the top. Inside this room, there's presents. A desk and a teddy bear at the bottom. I snag the bear and I make my way towards the table. As I do, one of the presents falls over. I already know that this game is going to do the thing where random stuff happens to make you feel like you're being watched. And it's kind of working. I check out the desk and find a witch's diary. I'm actually stoked to find this because I'm desperately curious to uncover the mysteries of the house. And it reads, I was sick, so no one played with me. My father and mother didn't love me. So I'm dealing with a witch that's potentially dying or died. I check the cabinet beside the desk and it tells me, open once the house is returned to normal. With the diary read, I head back to the previous room and try to put the bear inside of the basket. But it's too big. With nothing left to do over here, I decide to check the other side of the hall. It's creepy. There's barely any light. There's cobwebs and just a lack of anything. There's a door at the top, but it's locked. However, at the bottom of this room, I see a table with scissors on it. I go for the scissors and use them to cut off the limbs of the teddy bear. I had a feeling that this wasn't a regular teddy bear. And what's so curious is that Viola didn't even react to that. So can I throw out the term ludonarrative dissonance now? <laughs> Regardless, I took notice of her lack of emotions towards it and returned to the room with the basket. I stuff the freshly dismembered bear inside and hear the sound of something unlocking. I love how the game lets that sound ring out. And if you've been exploring, you'll know exactly where you need to go. So without any question in my mind, I head back over to the room with the scissors, but on my way there... One thing I'm starting to notice about this game is that it loves to jump scare you, and it also loves to instantly kill you. Right now, it isn't that much of an issue, but we'll talk more about this aspect of the witch's house later on in the video. Now that I know there is certain death waiting for me around the corner to the scissor room, I lure out the beast and avoid it. Before I can make my way through the unlocked door, a bloody teddy bear limb falls from the ceiling. Kind of gross, but I take it. Going through the door, I find myself inside of the dining area. It's pretty nice here, especially compared to the previous room. One thing I love about RPG Maker games is that the areas are usually pretty detailed. I found that most people who make games with this engine do so because it allows you to focus more on the visual and art side of things, more so than the technical. And I feel like this room is a great example of that. It's a beautiful room, with a giant table in the middle, chairs surrounding it on all sides, and also, apparently a skull on the table. Kind of weird, not gonna lie. But there's also a book on the table that says, check for poison. I'm just gonna assume this is referring to the literal hollowed out skull just across the way. There's also a fireplace right above the table, but unfortunately there's nothing inside but soot. However, there is a door up at the top of the room with a note beside it that says, the cook is busy, lend a hand. Now, I've played enough horror games to know that if I literally lend them a hand, it will be cut from my arm. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Going through the door, I find myself in the kitchen area, and immediately upon entering, there's this incessant sound of chopping. Looking more closely, I see a knife being used on the chopping board and a vague outline of a person by it. Before trying to talk to the invisible person, I read the book on the table below them. It's titled Aristocratic Dining and goes into detail about how noble people use silverware. It also conveniently says that silver will change color upon contacting poison. I also notice a door at the bottom of the room, but it's locked. With nothing left to do in the kitchen, I interact with the invisible person, and they tell us that they're so busy. I'm given the option to lend them a hand, and I wanted to see what would happen, so I select the option. instant death. I reload and go back to the invisible person. This time, I give them the bloody teddy bear limb that I had picked up in the scissor room. Instead of them killing me, they decide to give me a silver key. And just like unlocking a door with a key, I hear the click of the answer in my head. Silver key in the skull bowl. I head back to the dining room, plop the key in the goop of the skull bowl, and the key turns black. Just like that, I hear the sound of a door unlocking.
The Witch's House does this thing where it takes what would be a standard level and breaks it down into a floor in the house. It's one of the things that stood out the most to me, honestly. On my first playthrough, I was climbing up through the house and didn't even feel like I was moving to the next level. And as I played through multiple times, that feeling never went away. You know, whereas in a Mario game, you know you're leaving World 1 and entering World 2. It's so seamless here that it never feels like I'm doing anything but exploring a house that I can't escape. So with that, I find myself climbing the stairs to the second floor. But as I enter the stairway, I see a girl with purple hair. And then she vanishes. The game does a wonderful job of tossing these breadcrumbs at you that keeps you wanting to move forward. On the second floor, there's more to explore this time, and that familiar black cat has followed me up here. While I love this floor, the game does ramp up those instant kills, which I'm not the biggest fan of. And my first experience with that was going through the first door as I entered the new area. It's a dark, dingy room filled with cobwebs, buckets, and dim lighting. It feels like the way a basement smells. I see a note on the table inside and something stuck in the web. I search some of the barrels in this room and I find a rope. Since it's a horror game, I have a pretty strong feeling that somebody is going to hang themselves with it. When I went in the first time, I moved one of the barrels in front of the table and couldn't read the letter. I thought to myself, no biggie, and I went about my business. I go over to the corner and see that there's a golden butterfly caught in the web. I take this thing and book it out of the room as quickly as I can. Unfortunately for me, as I go to leave, the door is locked now, and without a moment's notice, I'm eaten by a giant spider. So here is the worst problem with this game. Instant deaths are not fun. If you do the wrong thing in the wrong place, you're dead. There's a few instances where you can avoid death, but those are chase sequences. And I don't need to harp on this because I'm sure the majority of people who have played this have already shared the exact same sentiment. But while I hate them, I also kind of like them. You yeah, weren't expecting that, were you? The annoyance of the instant deaths really only affects somebody on their first playthrough. Sort of. Uh, we'll get back to that. Uh, because the moment you go through this section again, you know what's going to happen. And it creates this interesting moment where you're almost peering into the future of what can happen and skirting along the sidelines to avoid it. But anyway, I'll complain about that again because it happens a lot more. When I came back to this room after my untimely death, I decided to read the note on the table first. And it warns about the spider being colorblind. So now I know to save this room and come back once I can plop something else in the web. And that's exactly what I do. I go and explore one of the other rooms. This one has tons of books in it and a mirror that's calling my name. I like this room in particular because it gives some extra lore and understanding to what's going on and what's happened here. The first two books I read are called The Witch's House 1 and 2. They go on to describe that keys don't open the doors, that something else must serve as a key, and that the witch's magic can make the house change form. Basically, we're given the reason as to why we can't progress through doors unless we finish the puzzles. But this is where it gets really interesting. There's a book in the back titled A Funny Story, and it reads, Once upon a time, there was a rich man pulling along a cart full of treasure. His cart had broken down in the woods, but there came a passing hunter and his dog. The rich man pleaded to the hunter to keep a close eye on his cart, to which the hunter agreed. The rich man went to get a new cart. Meanwhile, the hunter kept watch. Night soon fell and the hunter grew worried for his elderly mother still at home. So the hunter told the dog to watch the cart and went home to check on his mother. When the man returned, he saw the dog on guard, so he gave the dog a reward for his master, a silver coin to carry in his mouth. The dog ran all the way home and brought his master the coin. But the hunter flew into a rage. I told you to watch the cart, and what did you do? You stole from it. So the master killed the dog. <laughs> As I finish reading the story, one of the chairs bursts with laughter. It's a strange response, and even weirder is how our little protagonist isn't responding to any of it. Then we have the final piece of information that we can read in this room, and it's an old newspaper clipping. It goes on to talk about a seven-year-old girl named Ellen, who went missing and her parents were found with stab wounds on their body. If you head to the bottom of the room, you can see another invisible person. What I didn't know in my first playthrough is that this is the librarian, and he's muttering to himself about not being able to tie the books. But lucky for him, I've got a rope, 
Now, I'm kind of a bit hesitant to hand it to him, but I kind of need it so that I can get whatever he has for me. And when I give him the rope, he gives me the Book of Death. What I did when I first played through this game is that I would purposely use every item, even if I knew it would kill me. I was genuinely curious about what would happen, which ties back to me not necessarily hating the instant deaths. So if you decide to read the Book of Death, I'll give you one guess as to what happens. You die. It's a cool animation though, because Viola starts reading it and then she rubs her eyes, which makes them bleed profusely. The amount of ways to die in this game is honestly impressive, and they all have a unique way that kills you. So we have the Book of Death. We can't do anything in that spider room until we find something to put on the web. The Book of Death won't work. I already tried. But there's two more doors on the floor. One of them is locked, so technically only one. Stepping into this last room, we find a blue butterfly. Unfortunately, the glass display case won't budge and we can't get it out. As I walk around the room, there's some weird banging sound, and the glass on the far end of the display is now cracked. But I, I bet that won't be anything bad, though. At the far end of the room is a bookcase that's missing a single book. Bingo, bango. I throw the death book in, and then the music stops. I start walking back to the door, and a skull starts chasing me. This is one of the instances where we can run from it, so I like this. I run away and leave the room, and when I go back inside, it's gone. I pick up the butterfly and make my way to the spider room exchanging the blue butterfly for the golden one. I go back to the hallway, and as I do, the butterfly flutters out of my hands, and the door at the end of the hall unlocks. Second floor finished. I'm into the third floor of the house, and it starts off pretty... Uh, okay, that was dumb. Let me try that again. I'm into the third floor of the house. I've dodged the sword that flew at me that was nearly impossible to know to move out of the way on my first time going down the hallway, and... Okay, so I died like five times on this section. I'm not, I'm not even going to lie. I'm not going to try and pretend that I use my professional senses to move out of the way and safely make it across. This crab killed me. But once you memorize the patterns and you avoid them, you're, you're clear. And now we're into the real meat of this floor. The third floor of the witch's house is probably one of my favorites. And the main reason being, you know, we get a pet frog. And after you made it past the BS that is the knife hallway, you get to go into this room that has a tiny little frog in a pool of water. He's so sweet. He has a little heart pop up above his head when you interact with him. And then you can take him with you. You know, I, I said yes real fast to that. I sure hope nothing bad happens to our frog. I mean, I, I doubt it would though, right? Exploring the rest of this new hall shows us another door and a small bridge at the bottom. Unfortunately, the door is locked. So our only option is to deal with this small bridge. At the end of the bridge is a lever, and inspecting the bridge shows that it would break under our weight. But we can send the frog across. But I don't want to. I mean, what if he dies? But it, it's something that I have to risk. So I send him over the bridge, and I watch with each hop as he moves towards the lever. He makes it, hits the lever, and starts coming back towards me. We can finally go through the door, and it's one of those puzzles where you have to make one side match the other. It's a cool puzzle, but I'm not going to go into detail because I used my homeschool brain and I finished it real quick. So the room matches and I start to leave, but before I do, my little frog friend begs to go with me. I mean, how can I say no to that face? Not a chance. He hops into my arms and we head out. There's another witch's diary in this room and it gives us even more information on our witch, Ellen. It says, My father and mother didn't love me, so I ex them. I've been in this house ever since. As I read this, it starts to dawn on me that this witch is horribly emotionless. She has shown no remorse towards killing her parents and instead has lamented the fact that she's stuck in this house. It makes me wish I could play through the game as Ellen and see her point of view on things. With the diary read, we're now heading into the next room. But before we do, there's a note on the wall. It reads, Through this door, until the next, let nothing distract you. As soon as I read that, I knew I was going to get distracted, but I still pressed on. Stepping into the next room reminds me of the first hallway with the swords, and the moment that I thought that, I heard the sound of a sword whizzing towards me, and instantly moved out of the way. 
Of course, I died. It's a, it's a cool death, though. I go back again and don't stray from the path. The sword flies through me. I see glimmering objects and the darn cat again, but I ignore it all. I'm safe. Well, sort of. Because now I'm in a tiny room that has a note on the ground telling me it's hungry. I already know what's going to happen. You don't just throw me into a tiny room with a note that says it's hungry while I have a little frog with me. There's one door in this room and something is blocking it. When you listen, you can hear something. And when you peer through the window on the door, you see slimy scales. Now, if you open the door yourself, you'll get eaten by a snake. So, unfortunately, that's not an option for us. The only thing we can do is sacrifice our frog. So I push the frog through the window, and then there's silence. Opening the door shows the snake is gone, and so is the frog. It hurt to lose that frog. I love that frog. But now that we're past the frog death, we're in a room with cat statues, and the black cat is back again. As we move forward, we enter the last puzzle room of this floor. There's a note on the wall that says, Go where only one eye is open. Seems easy enough, right? Walking down the hall, there's a face with two eyes closed and an open mouth. Walking past it is another one, and then at the end is one with two eyes open. I wish I was smarter, because I hate admitting that this stumped me. (laughs) I I climbed into almost all these mouths until I realized that the answer was inspecting the wall between the closed eye and the open eye. Let me just say, I dislike this puzzle. I believe this is the first time the player has to interact with something that doesn't have any form of marking or anything to make it stand out. It's just a regular wall tile. I think it's cool, but I don't think it's an intuitive answer to the puzzle. Regardless, that's the third floor of this house. So we've gone through three floors of this sentient house. Now is a wonderful time to talk about what we know so far. The house is alive. There's a witch named Ellen who is inside of it. There's a black cat that's following us. And we're playing as a blonde-haired girl named Viola who isn't really reacting to any of the horrific things happening around her. Needless to say, I'm somewhat confused. Why did the witch kill her parents? Who were those two invisible people we interacted with? Who, or what, is this cat? Even though I'm throwing out questions left and right, I'm loving the experience of this game. It gives me enough information to keep me moving forward, but not enough to have it all unravel before me. And I think that's one of the greatest strengths of the witch's house. Yeah, there's some absolute bullcrap mechanics that kill you instantly, but I'm not playing an RPG Maker game for the riveting gameplay. And it seems like the creator knows it because we've been drip-fed little morsels of information about Ellen. So let's see what the fourth floor holds for us. This is probably one of my favorite floors gameplay-wise. The main theme here is trying to make a sound in each of the four rooms so that you can open the way forward. When I first played this, I went into the painting room. The first thing inside of this room is a note that says, Blue eyes see the score. And going further inside, there's pumpkins, playing cards strewn about on a table, and a locked door. As I started inspecting everything in the room, one of the pumpkins ended up making a sound. And continuously interacting with the pumpkin unlocks the door. Going inside reveals a room with a riddle and various objects. The riddle is, I can be the sun, I can be the sand, I can be a bird, what am I? Now, I wish I could say that I got this on my first try, but I am terrible with riddles. So after a few failed answers, I finally selected the clock and I got it right. And once you do, you get the queen key. With the key in hand, I made my way over to the room beside this one, and found a music box on the table. Inserting the queen key makes it start playing, and that's all there is to this room, puzzle-wise. Not the most interesting, but it gets the job done. Inside of this room is a door leading to an area with another witch's diary. The more I write about this game and reflect on what I enjoyed, I find that I almost was always the most excited to find another diary. And when we read the diary, it says, After that, I X all my friends who came over to play. Then I fed them all to the house. But it wasn't enough. With each entry we find, the witch shows more of her character. She's killed her parents and her friends and shows no remorse. The only one she genuinely cares about is herself. 
Going back to the beginning of this video, I mentioned how we had a letter on our person. Our dad was telling us not to go too deep into the forest. And now we're reading about the witch feeding her friends to the house. Are we a friend of this witch? Or are we just a girl who's gotten lost? Regardless, the breadcrumb trail is in full effect, and now I'm even more interested in going further into this house. We technically have one more room we can go to. If we were to head back into the riddle room, it would be changed. It's now a single clock with a chair. And pushing the chair to the clock, we can climb up and attempt to use an item on it. We don't have the item yet, so our only other option is to go to the last unexplored room. Inside, we find a beautiful grand piano, a note, some books, and a locked door at the top. Reading the note in this room shows that we need sheet music and that the piano will play itself. Now, a fun death in this room is that if you play the piano, you'll get eaten by it. And I'm going to guess that this is probably a throwback to that scene in Mario 64 where the piano just, like, takes him out. But not only do we have that note on the wall, we have a book that talks about the eye colors of women in the region depending on their hair color. So this was probably the part that stumped me the most. Because after reading that book, we find out that silver eyes go with black hair. And we need silver eyes to find our next item for the piano. So if we go to the painting room and we interact with the painting of the black haired woman, it just describes her hair color. And that's it. But if you go to the bottom of the room and interact with the wall that she's looking at, you'll find the sheet music that we need. I think this part is just plain dumb. I already dislike interacting with things that are considered background pieces, and I think this is the worst example of it. After interacting with the correct piece of the wall, we find the sheet music, but not before the woman in the painting hurls herself at us. And the worst part of this is that when she starts chasing you, if you run to the door like you've done with every previous enemy, it's locked and she kills you. The correct way to do this is to run to her painting and tear it down. Now, I like that, but I don't like how you probably won't guess this and then die on your first experience with her. And I think that may be my biggest complaint. I've been trying to pinpoint what it is that frustrates me about these deaths. It feels so unfair when you die on your first experience because you don't know what to do. When you have only a few seconds to react and then you're killed because you went to the door instead of the painting, but the game had previously conditioned you to head for the doors when an enemy is chasing you. <laughs> it's not the end of the world, but like, I think these moments with the enemies could have been dealt with so much better. Instead of our painted lady running at us like a freight train, maybe having her pick up momentum so that we were able to make more than one mistake before our death. And it, it, I don't think it would have felt so cheap. Anyway, with the painting lady dead, we now have the sheet music. Placing it on the music rest of the piano, it starts playing by itself. And a key pops out of the vase beside it and we can go back to the riddle room. Putting the newly acquired king key inside the clock makes the final sound we need, and... The door unlocks in the piano room. Heading through to the next area, we find ourselves in this beautiful, gorgeous, ornate room. There's stained glass windows and a statue of a sobbing woman in the middle. If we talk to her, she says she's looking for her ring, but she can't find it. Now, there isn't much for us to do here. There's a door at the top and it's locked, but oh, oh, there's some cracks in the wall beside one of the stained glass windows. If we interact with it, it breaks apart and lets us go through a small passage to a new area. Let me just say, that the puzzle with the mouths and the eyeballs, where I had to interact with a section of the wall that looked like every other section, could have been completely avoided with something like this. It is so puzzling to me that just a few rooms past that the creator adds something like this, and this is optional too. But it brings us to a new witch's diary that reads, I hate my illness. It kept me from going outside. It kept people from loving me. I mean, I genuinely feel bad for the witch. 
And as we step back into the room with the statue, the sound of crashing is heard. Now we can't go forward, so we go back to the piano room. Inside, the room is in disarray, and up at the top, there's now a fireplace. Inspecting it shows a ladder that allows us to descend, and it takes us to... the dining area. So now that we've made our way back to the dining area, the room is different. There's statues surrounding the table and an arrow pointing towards the kitchen. If there's one thing I'm good at, it's following obvious clues. So I head to the kitchen and immediately hear the sound of something boiling. The invisible person that was in the kitchen is now gone. And instead, there's a pot that's begging for us to turn off the burner. Now, when we had first entered the kitchen, back when the game started, there was a shelf pushed up to the right side of the wall. It's now been moved and it's revealed a door. I love how the game has brought us back to this area. And I especially love how the house can change shape so you can revisit areas and they can be different. Now, I do wish this theme had been explored more because I feel like it could have really done some cool things. But anyways, now they go too deep into a tangent here. Going through the newly uncovered door, there's a ton of blood and skeletons all over the floor. Now, we're going to lovingly refer to this as the skeleton room. The skeleton room is small, but there's a glimmering object all the way to the left side of it. And when we make our way there and inspect the spot, we find that a pair of golden chopsticks are stuck between the skeleton's ribs. With them, we can head back to the kitchen and inspect the pot. I remove the lid and use the chopsticks to search inside, finding the pig ring. As I'm doing this, a face appears in the window behind me and starts to watch me. And if we try to leave at this point, the door will be locked. Reading the book on the table won't tell us about dining habits this time, but it will instead tell us to return them where they belong. So I mosey on back to the skeleton room, drop the chopsticks right back in the skeleton ribs, and I head out. And then I hear the sound of footsteps. I assume that it's the cook, and as I do, a timer appears. I only have a few seconds to run back to the fireplace before they find me. This part was exhilarating, and I loved it. I like the sense of dread and panic, but I'm actually able to make more than one slip up and not immediately die. So climbing back up the fireplace, I return to the sobbing statue and give her the ring. She thanks me, and the door unlocks. It's time to make our way to the fifth and final floor of the house. Usually the stairways that lead into the next floor are plain and feel like stairs your grandma would have, but this particular one is a stark contrast. We find ourselves in a beautiful hallway with giant stained glass windows. The light is beaming inside and the entire corridor has this gothic feel to it. As we walk through, one of the windows shatters and a creature hurls itself at us, only to be stopped by the girl with purple hair. What was the creature? Why did the purple-haired girl stop it? As I head up the stairs, I'm greeted with a small room that has a locked door, four tables, and three dolls. Match the colored dolls to their appropriate colored table, and we're done. The only issue is we're missing one doll. But regardless, the door opens for us. And this is where we get to see some fun stuff. As we pass through the doll room, we walk into this beautiful garden section. There's a giant tree at the top, as well as a white flower. And right in the middle is a bench with the black cat and a half-empty cup of ginger tea. This floor is actually one of the more complex ones, so I'm going to speed through it just a little bit. Basically, there's three different kinds of flowers here, and they all kind of hate each other. The white one's beautiful, and its petals glow in the rain. The yellow ones produce pollen, and the red grass is always lying. From the main garden area, we have three ways we can go. If we go left, we'll meet the yellow flowers and find a room that's too dark for us to see. If we go north, our path forward will be obstructed by vines. And if we go to the right, we'll be in a cell-like area. As I do with every directional decision, I go to the right. It reminds me of the second floor and the dusty, dark area that held the spider. Inside, there's a book that tells us about the three different flowers, a water chamber to the north that's currently empty, more vines that we can't progress past, 
and to our right are some cells, a bird cage, and the red grass. There's a prisoner inside the right cell that asks for some medicine, and what he means specifically is some of the pollen from the yellow flowers. So I talk to the red grass and they tell me how to kill the white flower back in the garden area. But before I kill the white flower, I head to the room with the yellow flowers and talk to them. They also ask me to kill the white flower, so I head out and I pluck it. It shrieks and drops its petals. The yellow flowers are elated that the white flower is gone and give me some of their pollen. I take it back to the prisoner in the cell and he gets angry because he can't smoke it. His fit of rage knocks over the bird cage and when I interact with it, I let the bird free. Now the vines are gone and we can move through those areas. I should also mention that there are small skulls that can be found throughout the floor, which we'll be needing for a puzzle later on. There's one that I grab back in the room with the yellow flowers that was underneath a table, and another appears beside the book that told us about the different types of plants here. Now, before we move forward, back in the room with the yellow flowers, there's a door that leads us to another witch's diary, and this one is stained with blood. The diary reads, Then a girl came over to play, a cute girl with golden braids. So now we know for certain that Viola was a friend of Ellen's. And recalling the past diaries, that's not a good thing. To get the device that the prisoner needs to smoke the pollen, we'll need to go through the dark room. Unfortunately, we don't have any light. So heading back to the main garden area, we can now go north and see what's inside. The moment we step in, a timer starts. The room is filled with poison, and we can only be inside for 15 seconds. A sign in the middle says, Poison fills this hall. Pass with colorless shoes. Inspecting the room, I find a small bottle and a skull. There's also a book on one of the tables that tells me how to complete the skull puzzle that we're going to find later on. I have everything from this room, so I head back to the cell area. Now, there was an area at the top that was sectioned off with vines, but now we can head through it. It's a long hallway with a note in a pot. The note reads, The skulls seal the water. And reaching inside of the pot, gives me another small skull. That's all the skulls that we need. So heading into the next room, we can do the skull puzzle. This one was pretty simple. It's a repeating pattern of four, and all I did was match the way the skulls were going. Once the skulls are in place, there's a lever at the top that we can now activate. Pulling it fills the water chamber. So I leave the skull room and head towards the water chamber, and what do you know? Giant skull. This puppy bursts out of nowhere, and luckily, this is an easy one to get away from. It chases me back to the puzzle room, and I give it the slip. Nothing to it. Inside the water chamber room, I fill the bottle with water and drop the white petals inside of it. The bottle begins to glow. Now we can head to that dark room. This is technically referred to as the dark maze, and I guess you can say that, but I got through it on my first try without getting lost because each wrong path is super short and just kind of ends. It is creepy though. The bottle with the petals like barely illuminates the surrounding area and it's incredibly claustrophobic. But I keep moving and I eventually make it to the end and what do I find? The jade pipe. Now that I've got the smoking device for the druggie, I head back to the cell and hand it over to the prisoner. He gets really excited and then just disappears. This is the problem with enabling people and their drug addictions. But when he disappears, the cell on the left finally opens up. I couldn't open it up before. And as I head inside, there's something wrapped in cloth. And what's under it? Red shoes. Now there's a note on the wall behind the shoes that says, Let them bleed. If you put these shoes on, Viola will get beheaded. I ain't trying to live that no head life. So instead, I head to the water chamber room and wash these suckers. And they turn transparent. And with that, we can traverse the poison room. Or at least I thought we were, because heading back towards the main garden area, the giant skull reappears. Now this one startled me, and I didn't have enough time to react before it plowed into me and tore me a new one. Maybe I'm old and my reactions aren't quick enough, but that's a cheap death. Anyway, I know it's coming, so I prepare myself, I avoid it, and then I make my way, finally, to the poison room. Now that I've washed the shoes, I can step across the moat of poison and make my way to the other side. As I'm walking through it, my own body falls from the ceiling, 
which is a little concerning. And I see a door on the right, and I'd be lying if I didn't try to go in it a few times, costing me a couple of deaths, but no, I kept going straight and I made it past the poison-filled room. Now, cool tidbit here, there was apparently another puzzle after this poison room, but it was removed by the creator in an update, and from what I've seen, there was all kinds of numbers and memorizing and bullcrap. Kind of happy it's not there. So hey, we don't have to do that puzzle, and instead find ourselves in a smaller garden area with a witch's diary in the middle and our friendly black cat. And if we talk to him, he asks, Yo, what do you suppose a friend is? Kind of a strange question, but I'm sure it was innocently asked. Reading the diary, it says, I wouldn't X her, because she would save me from my sickness. So I made her my friend. And so the plot thickens even more. Ellen has had her sights on Viola from the moment she met her. And from what I can tell, Viola is a trusting and sweet girl who most likely felt so much empathy towards her. We're almost at the end of this floor. And from what I can tell, we just need the doll for the other room. So going forward, I find myself in a dark room with cabinets. Inspecting them reveals this to be a medicine room. Considering what we read about Ellen being sick, this was most likely a room that was used a lot for her. Interacting with the cabinet that has blood on it reveals a small bottle on the shelf. And now I got me a cute little bottle. The description of the item says that it's medicine that will wilt the witch's roses, and it smells sweet. So this must be what we need to escape the forest and finally head home. As I'm beginning to leave, something comes crashing through one of the windows in the room. This time, it's surprisingly not an enemy. I go to inspect it and find that it's a doll head. Boom, bam, this is what we need. Well, sort of. We still need the body, but this is a good start. The moment I grab the doll head, two eyeballs burst into the room, and this is the part of the game that I absolutely despise. If you don't stand in a specific part of this room when you grab the doll head, you will probably die. So I stand at the bottom of the room, slip under the eyeball closest to me, and make it out alive. Now, if you remember from the poison room, as I was walking through it with the transparent shoes, there was a door that I didn't go through. If we head back there, we'll find the doll's body. Going back into the doll room, I place our newly acquired figure onto the table, and the entryway to the witch's room appears. The hallway is narrow. There's a trail of blood that leads to a door with a note, and the note echoes the words that we saw when we first entered the house. Come to my room. And on the other side? Light. We find ourselves in a gorgeous, light-soaked hallway. There's paintings of flowers adorning the walls between the windows. It feels like we've climbed out of the depths of hell and made our way to heaven. And at the end of the hallway is our faithful black cat. Only this time, he's dead. I was genuinely surprised to find him dead when I played this, and there's no closure about his death. We just find him dead in front of the witch's room. Let's just do a quick recap. We're playing as a girl named Viola. She's sweet and caring. Her father asked her to be careful of going too deep into the woods. We found ourselves in the house of the witch who killed her parents and has also fed her friends to the house. <laughs> At this point, I'm wanting answers. I want all of it to come together and click. I was genuinely so excited to reach this part because I couldn't wait to see what was inside. And as we step in, we find a small bedroom. It's eerily quiet. A blood-stained bed is anchored in the middle. There's a toppled-over chair beside it and a cup on the floor. A mirror up at the top. A few bookshelves and a vase filled with roses. But the most eye-catching piece of decor inside is the table at the top right that holds our final witch's diary. Now listen, I watched the final season of Attack on Titan, so I was ready to read this and have nothing answered. But I pushed those thoughts aside and read the final diary. I'm going to die from my sickness, so I'm going to take her body. I'm going to live on in her body. It's okay, right? Because we're friends. She'll give me her body. Because we're friends. That's why you came to play with me today, 
right, viola. Right when we finished reading the diary, the monster that we saw in the hallway that was stopped by the purple-haired girl dives through the window and begins to crawl towards us. And then we get the final chase sequence of the game. And honestly, this one isn't too bad. I love how you have to run through the whole house to get to the exit. And it kind of ties everything together and makes this universe feel more cohesive. I love it. But what I don't love is that your margin of error is razor thin. And if you misjudge something, you're dead. So the thrill of this chase can 100% be negated if you have to do it multiple times, like I did. And with Ellen chasing me through the house, I managed to make my way to the front door and can finally leave her domain. I head down the path away from the house and make my way to the area that we woke up in. And in the spot that we started, there's a letter. It's the other half of the letter that we woke up with. And it reads, Dear Viola, I'm sorry for yelling at you yesterday. There's an old legend that says a witch lives in the forest and kidnaps children who get lost there. Your friend's house is very near the forest, so I was worried about you. Your friend's name was Ellen, right? Well, and there we have it. This letter connects a lot of the dots, and I was so happy when I read it because it pieced so much of it together for me. But we still haven't left the forest yet, so we continue down the path, use the cute little bottle on the roses, and we're free to leave. As we head down the path, there's a man holding a gun. He doesn't have a name, but I was absolutely assuming that this was Viola's father. And as he runs up to us, his name changes to Viola's dad. He goes on to ask if we're safe and that he's been worried. And since it's so late, he had been searching the whole forest for us. As the two of them begin to leave, the sky darkens. It's a little goofy considering the music just cuts out, but I can forgive it. The camera starts to pan to the path that we walk down, and the legless girl with a trail of blood can be seen. She crawls towards us, uttering unintelligible words, but Viola's father steps in front to shield his daughter. I thought at this point the dad was going to get got, but instead he pulls out his gun and shoots the legless girl twice. With that, the two run out of the forest. The credits roll and Viola stops on the path and looks back. Is she worried about the legless girl returning? As the credits end, the black cat can be seen once more. I was hoping at this point we'd have more answers than questions, but something just didn't sit right with me. Why is Viola so unbothered by everything that she's seen throughout the house? Why was there a black cat following us who could talk? Why was the witch in such a dismembered state? It feels like I missed something. And it also says end with a question mark. Well, the good news is that I did miss something. If you remember from the beginning of the video, when Viola found the first witch's diary, there was a locked cabinet beside it, and it told us to come back once the house returned to normal. I completely forgot and just sped out of the house as quickly as I could. So what we just witnessed was one of four different endings. And this other ending gives us a twist that I wasn't expecting. But to preface going forward, there's more you can unlock with this story if you meet a certain requirement. I played through the witch's house around six times, so I'm not going to recount every one of those. 
The reason I played through it that many times is if you don't talk to the black cat at all, you'll get some unique dialogue with him at the end, as well as some different interactions with items in the witch's room. Now, I don't think I've dug too hard into this game throughout the video, but I'm going to now. This game is an absolute nightmare to play through without talking to the cat. That stinky little cat is our only save option, and I know that there's apparently some way you can talk to him in the Hall of Distractions, but I didn't do it because I didn't know about it and I didn't want to screw up my run. So, do you remember how I was annoyed at the instant deaths with this game? <laughs> oh buddy, when you can't save and you die to something stupid and you have to start back at the beginning, it gets to you. And this is where the majority of my frustrations towards those cheap deaths come from. They aren't that bad when you can save, but the moment that's taken away and one simple slip up costs you an entire run, it makes you feel less like you messed up and that it was an unfair situation you found yourself in. This is an optional step though, so I guess I can't bash it too much, but at the same time, if you want to fully unveil the story, this isn't really an optional step. So I didn't even play this game on the hardest difficulty, which apparently adds some new interactions and puzzles, but playing through this without saves was a nightmare, and I would not do it again. However, I was pleasantly pleased with the outcome of what happened. So let's fast forward through all of these attempts that I made, and let's plop ourselves down in the hallway that leads to the witch's room. It looks the same until we make it to the spot where we had found the dead cat. This time, he's alive and we can talk to him. He tells us that he's disappointed we never asked him for help even once. But he's not surprised though, because the house was giving us notes, and it can always tell who its master is, regardless of the body they're in. Halfway through his speech, his name changes from Black Cat to Demon, and he says, Good luck with the rest, Ellen, my faithful witch. Let me tell you, I was not expecting this twist. The whole time we were playing as the witch. And I love this so much because it completely flips everything around. If you remember throughout the video, I made comments about the lack of emotion and reaction from our character. Was it a limitation of RPG Maker? Was it laziness on the developer's part? Or perhaps it was because we were playing as the witch who had killed her parents, her friends, and fed them to the house. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this. And the best part is we're not even done yet, because the dialogue exchange between Ellen and the cat opens up so many more questions. Does this mean Viola is inside Ellen's body? Why is the legless girl so mutilated? Oh buddy, we're about to find out. Now when we step inside of the witch's room, we are actually stepping inside of our room. Each object in the room is now being viewed from a different perspective. The bed is where she used to sleep. The chair is where Viola would sit and talk with her. The cup is the same one she gave Viola medicine with. And when I was experiencing all of this, it felt so strange. My entire journey through this game was me believing I was playing as the girl who happened to get lost in the woods and stumbled upon a witch's house. But now it's flipped, and I'm the witch who stole the girl's body and is trying to escape her own prison. But it gets even better, because reading the witch's diary gives us so much new information now that we know we're playing as the witch. We find out that Ellen knew she could use Viola's kind-heartedness for her own gain. She knew if she made herself pitiful enough, Viola would feel bad for her. So Ellen cut off her own legs and gouged out her own eyes. And then when she switched bodies with Viola, she gave her throat-burning medicine, lying that it would stop the pain of the illness. When the legless girl bursts into the room, the entire tone is shifted. We're no longer running for our lives from a witch that wants to take our body. We are the witch, running away from the girl whose body we stole. And on the first playthrough, it seemed like the legless girl was just a monster. Her speech was unintelligible and slurred, and we didn't know why she was dismembered. But now we can look at her and see the bloody trail from her legs were caused by Ellen. Her gouged out eyes were also from Ellen. And not just that, but when she's talking, you can make out what she's saying. She's desperately begging Ellen to give her the body back. And then the chase through the house feels nothing like it did on the first playthrough. As I hurriedly rushed out due to not wanting the witch to catch me, now I'm leaving because I want to escape from the prison I had been trapped in. This time, though, I didn't forget about the cabinet from the beginning. 
If you make a detour to that room, you can pick up Ellen's knife, and this is how you get the true ending. I grab the knife, head outside, and I'm free. But it feels so different now. I don't feel triumphant. I feel bittersweet. I'm the one who tricked an innocent girl into trading her body for a day, under the guise that I'd give it back. I'm the monster. So we walk away from the house, back towards where we woke up and pick up the letter again. And reading the worry from the father in the letter this time is so sad. Then we use the bottle on the roses, and the witch is finally free. Well, almost. Because, like the first ending, the legless girl makes her way to us. But we don't see the father this time. No. There is a conversation that happens between the two girls, and it starts with our witch. The legless girl tries to talk, but due to the throat-burning medicine, her speech is barely recognizable. And then, Ellen stabs her. She begins to taunt the girl. She recounts how Viola felt so sorry for her and was willing to switch bodies with her. However, as Ellen enjoyed her new painless body, she wouldn't give it back. And she breaks her promise of giving the body back after a day. Ellen then continues to taunt the girl until Viola's father appears. He rushes to her, and Ellen pretends to be afraid of the legless girl. The real Viola tries to speak to her father, but she can't even make out a single word. The father tries to protect, who he thinks is his daughter, and shoots the legless girl twice in the head. Just like last time, the two of them escape the forest. But before Ellen exits the forest, she stops and lets out a chuckle. And like our previous ending, the black cat appears and disappears with Ellen's old body. There's one more ending that you can get. When you start up a new game, Viola can't move for an hour. If she stays still, the witch's roses and magic will disappear allowing her to escape the forest before nightfall. Since it's still morning, Viola's father will be looking for her, and she'll be able to escape. And with that, my friends, we've reached the end of The Witch's House. There's actually more that I can go into in terms of backstory on some of these characters. So if you'd like to see a follow-up to this video, please let me know. <laughs>